Hello and welcome. I'm Maria Williams with the Collaborative on Health and the Environment. CHE enjoys bringing you the latest environmental health science through our partnership calls and webinars, science serves, publications, and social media. I would like to welcome everyone to today's CHE EDC Strategies Partnership webinar, which is titled Exposure to DES During Pregnancy and Multigenerational Neurodevelopmental Deficits. Our moderator today is Katie Pelch, Senior Scientist at the Endocrine Disruption Exchange. We will leave time following the presentation for a brief Q&A session. You may type in questions through the Q&A feature available on the menu bar at the top of your window at any point during the presentation. After the presentation, our moderator will read out questions for our speaker to respond to. We will get to as many comments and questions as we can during the Q&A period. For those of you who called in on the phone, we have posted slides to accompany today's webinar on our website. You can download these by going to healthandenvironment.org. Please scroll to the bottom of the page and select today's webinar. On the webinar page is a link to the slides. Everyone on the webinar right now is muted with the exception of our moderator and our speaker. This webinar is scheduled to last for 30 minutes and is being recorded for our call and webinar archive. With that, I'll turn things over to you, Katie. Thanks, Maria. Welcome, everyone. We are very honored today to have Dr. Marianthi Kumar-Zogalu with us today as our featured presenter. She is an environmental epidemiologist and assistant professor in the Department of Environmental Health Sciences at Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health in New York. Her research focuses primarily on how environmental exposures impact human health, with a special emphasis on air pollution exposures and neurological and psychiatric outcomes. Today, however, she will tell us about her exciting work evaluating neurodevelopmental deficits in children whose grandmothers took diethylstilbestrol during their pregnancy. So thank you, Dr. Kumar Zogalu, for presenting for us today. And with that, I will turn it over to you now. Thank you, uh, Katie and Maria, for, uh, the and to the uh, CHE for the invitation and the opportunity to present this work that I'm very excited about. So uh, thank you. Yes, the talk of um, my presentation today is exposure to DS or diethylstilbestrol during pregnancy and multigenerational neurodevelopmental deficits. This is um, a brief outline of my presentation today. We'll go through uh, an introduction, then a bit more specific as about the stu one study, this study that we conducted, and then some discussion at the end. And we'll start with uh, what are endocrine disrupting chemicals. So this is uh, a definition by the Environmental uh, Protection Agency, if you'd like, but basically, Endocrine disrupting chemicals, or EDCs, as I will be calling them throughout the presentation today, are chemicals that uh, interfere with our endocrine systems, basically mess up our hormones. And several high production volume chemicals are ubiquitously, ubiquitously sorry, <laughs> strong uh, bad word, ubiquitously present in commercial products, and they, they are known or suspected EDCs. And due to their very widespread use in consumer products, the population-wide exposure to those known and suspected EDCs is highly prevalent. And when I say highly prevalent in this next slide, I have just a few examples of products that contain such EDCs. From uh, cleaning products to consumer products to shampoos and children's toys and plastics and uh, flame retardants in furniture, Really, this is a very long list, and even this is a limited uh, list, not including um, all um, EDCs. And why we care so much about these EDCs is that they have been linked to numerous health outcomes, and that includes disruption to male and female reproductive systems, development of cancer, obesity, and what the talk of today's uh, talk is, uh, neurodevelopmental uh, disorders, including attention deficit hyperactivity disorders, and uh, many studies have shown increased risk of um, ADHD uh, following uh, exposure in utero to uh, those EDCs. I will uh, briefly discuss uh, multi and transgender effects of area of research. But before doing that, we need to define what multi versus transgenerational um, means. So if you focus your attention on the mouse, I don't know if you can actually see my uh, 
pointer, but um, on the mouse on the right, you can see that uh, if F0 is the exposed mouse, the directly first generational exposed mouse, F1 in this case would be the fetus in the womb of the exposed mouse. And uh, if that fetus is female, uh, that's an important distinction, then automatically with one exposure to that F0 generation, uh, we also expose the germline of F1 automatically. So, so this is three generations just exposed at once. Um, the F3 would, would be the fourth generation, the offspring of the F2 generation, that would be the first generation that we would observe transgenerational effects. But in this um, F0 to F2, uh, generations, the effects would be considered multi-generationals as they're all exposed at once. On the other hand, if you focus at the mouse on the left-hand side, uh, if that is either uh, a female mouse, uh, well, this obviously applies to humans as well, um, but if it's a female that's not pregnant or a male, then with one exposure, it's um, that F0 generation and F0's uh, germline or F1 that are affected. So in that case, uh, the transgenerational effect would occur at the F offspring of F1. So F2 would be the first generation that we would observe transgenerational effects if there were any. Uh, and for what we'll be talking today is only multi-generational. So it's one exposure that could affect three generations at once. There is, as I said, a very increasing interest in the potential multi- and transgenerational effects of EDC exposures, that it's been uh, increasing in, in the field. And one potential hypothesized biological mechanisms, that's not the only one, is through epigenetic reprogramming of the uh, germline. So um, specifically, EDCs are uh, linked to molecular alterations to the germline mediated through epigenetic mechanisms to promote outcomes in the subsequent generations. There has been evidence from toxicological studies um, as uh, to show these links. So for example, a study here, I give two examples, both of these are in mice, a study looking at phthalate exposures uh, during pregnancy, these were later linked uh, and showed to alter third generation behavior and stress responses, um, uh, uh, alterations in corticos corticosterone levels and pitu pituitary gene expression and behavior, and also BPA or bisphenol A, uh, a known plasticizer um, exposure during pregnancy has been linked to changes in third to fifth generation, now we're talking uh, transgenerational, uh, social interactions in mice. However, even though there is biological plausibility for these multi and transgenerational associations, and there is toxicological evidence from um, studies in animals, there is not many human studies looking at this. And actually, before we did this, this study uh, that I will be presenting today, there was no epidemiological evidence of multi generational uh, effects of EDC on neurodevelopment in humans. Some uh, some evidence about other outcomes, but nothing on your development uh, in humans. And so this is what we would uh, wanted to address with our study. We wanted to look at, again, multi-generational effects of EDC on neurodevelopment. We used as a case study the ethyl stilbestrol, DES. So this is the uh, exposure of interest in our study. And the outcome uh, of interest in neurodevelopment outcome, neurodevelopmental outcome was ADHD. Just a very brief background on uh, DES and diethyl stilbestrol. DES is a very potent perinatal EDC. It's structurally and functionally similar to BPA, although it should be noted that it's much, much more potent than uh, BPA, bisphenol A. It was prescribed between 1938 and 1971 to pregnant women to prevent pregnancy complications. It was thought to prevent pregnancy complications such as preterm births, miscarriages, so on and so forth. And although we do not know the exact number of women who use DES uh, during their pregnancy, it is estimated that approximately five to 10 million women in the US use DES uh, during this period. In 1953, not midway during this period that DES was being prescribed, a study came out that actually showed that taking DES doesn't really help much with pregnancy complications. There's, there's no benefit in taking DS. So a very slow phasing out of DS started. 
And in 1971, now a study came out showing that the daughters of women who took B DES during their pregnancy developed these very rare vaginal adenocarcinomas. Um, and so that led to an automatic DES ban. And since then, that was the first outcome that was identified um, after DES exposure in utero, but these DES daughters then have been um, uh, linked, or DES in these DES daughters has been linked to multiple reproductive outcomes uh, and uh, not just uh, this cancer. And there have been only a few, very few, uh, limited number of studies looking at third generation DES impacts now, and they have found uh, links with hypospadias in the grandsons of women who took uh, DES during pregnancy, delayed menstrual regularization in the granddaughters of the women who took DES, and also birth effects. But as I said, there is no study yet uh, until we uh, did our showing uh, any link or lack of link with neurodevelopment. So for our study, uh, we used information from the Nurses Health Study 2. This is a cohort of nurses. Uh, enrollment started in 1989. And uh, about 100, a little bit fewer than 120,000 uh, registered nurses between 25 and 42 years old enrolled in this cohort. Uh, the way the, this cohort works is that every two years, the um, PIs of the cohorts and the core of researchers working, working with uh, nurses' data uh, sent out uh, questionnaires. And these questionnaires ask questions about anything you can imagine, uh, including lifestyle risk factors, medication use, major illness occurrence. Uh, it's a very long list. And uh, we have observed an excellent rotation rate um, up to today is more than 90% uh, of the original cohort. And importantly for our study, all nurses to participants were born between 46 and 64. And this is the period that DES was being prescribed. Um, so I should say here that the nurses in our study are this F1 generation, are the daughters of the women who use DES during pregnancy. So I will be using F1 and nurses interchangeably, but uh, it's the same uh, middle generation in, in this case. This uh, slide just shows uh, the, uh, briefly the, a, a bit more information on, on the data that we use, as I said, enrollment started in 89. Um, uh, in the 1993 questionnaire, there was a question on whether uh, the nurse has, uh, knows if her mother used DES during uh, pregnancy with the nurse. And then 2005 and 2013, um, there was a question about ADHD. So the exclusion criteria for our study population, the final study population uh, sample was um, whether uh, these nurses had not returned the 93, 2005 and 2013 questionnaires. that are the important questionnaires uh, for information and exposure and outcome. Um, if the nurses reported no uh, life born children, so if there was no uh, third generation, we could not have observed ADHD in the third generation. And then finally, we had to remove multiple pregnancies. So that's uh, twins, triplets, et cetera, or pregnancies um, that resulted in births in the same calendar year. Just because uh, the way the ADHD question was asked, we would identify children with ADHD. Um, and now F2 are the, is the third generation, the children uh, by birth year. So we couldn't identify if there were more than two children, more than one children born in the same year. Uh, how many of them, if all of them had ADHD, developed ADHD. So F0 here is the generation, the mothers of the nurses, is the generation that might have taken DS during pregnancy. F1 are the nurses and F2 is the third generation, the children of the nurses. So in the end, we did, ended up having uh, a bit fewer than 50,000 uh, nurses and their mothers in our sample size and a bit more than 100,000 uh, children in the study population. DS, as I said, there was a, uh, to assess DS, there was a question in the 1993 questionnaire to the nurses, do you know your mother used DS while she was pregnant with you? Um, and to the nurses that answered yes to their question, uh, we sent up, this is a royal we, uh, the nurses uh, investigators sent out um, a supplemental questionnaire asking more information. Um, 
the response rate to that second questionnaire was uh, also excellent, was 85%. Um, and out of those, uh, approximately 90% said that yes, they were certain or somewhat certain that the F0 uh, indeed used DES. And there was a small proportion that were not certain and uh, a small proportion that said, well, you know what, no exposure. My, my mother did not use DES during pregnancy. So for our study, we only used uh, those responses that were certain or somewhat certain of F0, F0 DES use. And the supplementary questionnaire also included information on the trimester that DES was used. Do you know if your mother used DES uh, during pregnancy, the first, second, third trimester? And also don't know. There was an option of, I don't know. For ADHD, uh, the first question on ADHD in the nurses cohort, nurses two, sorry, cohort, um, was in 2005, has any of your children uh, been diagnosed with ADHD? Uh, unfortunately, that question did not include a sub question on how many children uh, of your children have been diagnosed and which of your children. So that was corrected in the 2013 questionnaire. Uh, the question was repeat repeated, um, has, have any of your children uh, received an ADHD diagnosis? But in this uh, instance now, there was a follow-up question about, uh, can you please let us know the birth years of your children that have been diagnosed? So that helped us identify uh, how many children out of the total children and which children. Uh, we only included in our analysis information uh, of uh, concordant answers between 2005 and 2013 to reduce um, outcome misclassification. Uh, we had 93% concordance across these two years. And we used the 2013 response to identify the number of um, children uh, per nurse with ADHD. Uh, for our potential confounders, now you can think this, uh, you can imagine how this is a slightly different setting that we're normally used to. Here, confounders could only be those factors that precede F0 uh, DES use. They need, a confounder need to precede exposures. So um, again, we were lucky enough that we had information on um, these F0s um, from the nurses themselves. So in 1999, um, in the 1999 questionnaire, F1s were asked if their mother smoked during pregnancy with them. So we had that information. Uh, and also in 2005, in the 2005 questionnaire, um, F1 or the nurses uh, reported their family's SCS, socioeconomic status, at their birth, and also some uh, questions about their mother's um, lifestyle, education, and uh, occupation. So in the end, uh, we adjusted for F1 rate and ethnicity, uh, race and ethnicity, F1 year of birth, both linear and quadratic, to account for time trends, both in the ADHD um, diagnosis, uh, potential trends, but also in DES use. And uh, also F0 smoking during pregnancy, F0 home ownership at F1 birth. And then uh, both for F1's mother and father, their education and their occupation. Our statistical analysis, again, wasn't that straightforward. Um, we, in utero, um, F1 exposure may affect the number of children that F1 might have, the nurse might have, right? As we said, DS is a very strong um, risk factor for, for reproductive outcomes. And also it could affect the likelihood that any of their children, the nurse's children, third generation now, might have ADHD. Uh, or more formally, the distribution of ADHD given DES may depend on the number uh, of children within nurse. And this structure is called informative clustering. So if we used uh, more traditional approaches to account for this clustering, like for example, standard generalized estimating equations, um, those would not be appropriate because they could lead to invalid uh, estimates and inferences. So we needed a design that uh, would be able to accommodate this potentially informative clustering and we used cluster weighted generalized estimating equations with a logit link um, because ADHD is binary now, uh, yes, no, to account for multiple um, children or F2 within the F0, uh, F1 pairs. And as weight, we used 
the inverse of the cluster size, in which case uh, cluster size in our case was the number of F2 children within F1. We adjusted for potential confounders, as I said in the previous slide. We also assessed the effect modification by F2 sex. Uh, I should say here, I'm not presenting any results because we did not observe any effect modification. The p-value was 0 0.62. So uh, moving on to our results, um, the table on your uh, left-hand side shows just some descriptive characteristics of our study population. Uh, in this population, about 2% of uh, the nurses' mothers used DS during pregnancy. Most of the nurses' mothers uh, had uh, finished high school and about 22% had some college. Uh, most of them, 63%, did not smoke during pregnancy. And uh, this was predominantly a white, non-Hispanic population. We also had uh, information on more than 100,000 uh, F2 children. This is the third generation. Uh, the median birth year of these children was 1983. And we uh, identified more than 5,000 ADHD cases, um, resulting in a 5.3% of, of the children being diagnosed with ADHD. Uh, I know with today's uh, known numbers about ADHD prevalence, the 5.3% does seem a bit low, but it is actually very well aligned with the prevalence reported um, the period, uh, for the period that these uh, children were born. And these are uh, actually our results of our analysis. Um, as you can see, any exposure to DES resulted in an increased odds of developing uh, ADHD of 36% uh, compared to uh, no DES exposure. And then we also looked at trimester specific effect estimates. Oh, and this, uh, excuse me, this 36% uh, was statistically significant. And uh, we also looked at trimester specific exposures. And uh, even though the uh, effect estimates for the second, third trimester and for the response I don't know were highly imprecise, we did observe uh, a highly significantly elevated odds ratio of 1.63 if DES was used during the first trimester. So what does this all mean, right? Uh, we found strong and harmful effects, uh, effect estimates of DES use on third generation ADHD. Uh, I, did not, I do not have time to talk about sensitivity analysis. If you have any questions about sensitivity analysis, please um, ask me at the Q&A uh, section, but our results were very robust to all sensitivity analysis that we tried. Um, the potential, one potential biological mechanisms, as I, mechanism, as I said earlier, is through epigenetic transgenerational inheritance. But I should also note that this is not the only possible mechanism for that. For example, right after we published um, our paper, uh, Dr. Javier Costas wrote a letter to the editor saying that, you know what though, um, it is, we know that endocrine disruption, disruptors do result in the second generation neurodevelopmental effects. So F1 could have ADHD or some uh, ADHD phenotype or traits. So the increase in F2 ADHD uh, could be due to assortative mating in the F1 generation among parents with greater ADHD phenotype resulting in increased genetic predisposition for ADHD. And yes, this is a very valid comment. Unfortunately, we do not have information of N1, F1 ADHD to assess that, but this, the, there, this is a potential plausible mechanism. Uh, but again, the important thing here is that it was all that was still due to F0 DES use. So it's still uh, the same uh, multi-generational effect, it's just a different pathway. Uh, we also saw um, the highest effect estimate and uh, most significant uh, when DES was used during the first trimester of pregnancy, uh, particularly. And the effect estimates in second and third trimester were weaker and not significant. So this attenuation and wider confidence intervals could be due to the smaller numbers. We did uh, observe 82 exposed cases uh, during the first trimester versus 33 and 27 for second and third trimesters. Um, 
or they could show that the first trimester could indeed be a critical window of vulnerability to DS exposure. Uh, early gestation uh, is known to be an especially sensitive period to maternal influences resulting in embryonic um, and germ cell reprogramming. So in conclusion, what does this all mean? You'll say, yes, my answer, this is very interesting. Uh, it's very important to understand the continuing adverse health effects of DS, but DS is banned now, uh, which is exactly true. But as I said, we use DS as a case study for endocrine disrupting uh, chemicals to which we are ubiquitously exposed today. So even though DES is banned, um, and although it is much more potent than any individual EDC to which we are exposed today, we are ex we still exposed to so many of them and there's no way to know if there's a cumulative impact. Um, and even though it, the effects of this, the cumulative effect of EDC exposure currently might not necessarily result in a clinical diagnosis of ADHD, which they might or might not, uh, we don't really know. Um, it is also uh, important to um, think, sorry, I just saw a question pop up and I lost my train of thought. Um, but it's also to, uh, important to study because even uh, if it changes uh, ADHD traits or behavioral traits in the general population, the um, population-wide effects uh, so, and societal impacts might be uh, important. So um, thank you very much. I would really like to thank my collaborators for this. Of course, this is not work that I just did by myself. Mark Weiskopf was my postdoctoral mentor at the time that I conducted the work. Uh, Brent, Alberto, and Eilis helped a lot from the conception to analysis to interpretation. And I would also like to thank Glenn and Sebastian, Sebastian who were not involved in this study, but uh, are really helping us now think on how we could move forward and addressing methodological issues related with multi-generational uh, studies and uh, epidemiologic analysis, because as you saw, this is not necessarily straightforward. So thank you very much for your attention and um, I'm happy to get any questions. I'm sorry I ran a little bit over time. No worries. Thank you, Dr. Kumar Zogalu. Uh, just a reminder, if you do have questions, you can type those in using the Q&A feature, which is found at the bottom of your screen. So we do have a couple of questions. Um, one is, have change generational effects on neurological function been studied in the rodent model? Or do you know if there's work to kind of, in using the rodent model, maybe that could tease apart that uh, question about the assortive mating? Um, ah, that's a good question. I don't know uh, if the Rodden models have, I don't know of any such studies, but that doesn't mean that there haven't been any. Um, so that's, that's a good question. Yes, I, um, there might have been any, if there haven't been any, we should definitely <laughs> look more into this. Very good. And do you have information on the relationship between effects in the F2 generation and effects in F1? In other words, were the F2 with ADHD more likely to come from F1 with DES-related health effects of any sort? Again, this is a very good question, but unfortunately, we do not have any information of it on F1 ADHD. So we could not look, we don't even know the prevalence of ADHD in F1. Uh, yeah. So we were not able to look um, into this in, with our data. I had one other follow-up question. Um, so you mentioned the trimester specific findings with the greatest impact being in the first trimester. And you alluded to the fact that this could be related to specific neurodevelopmental sensitivity at that time. But I wonder if we had any evidence or any reason to think that it could also be due to the way DES was prescribed. So I know that there were different dose regimes that were kind of used during the different time periods. Um. Yes, and again, I don't, I don't, um, I'm hesitant to draw any actual biological conclusion from our results just because we did not have enough numbers uh, in uh, trimesters two and three. So if you see the number of um, the prevalence of DES to use across uh, trimesters, it's very clear that DES, at least in our data, was most heavily prescribed during the first trimester. So our results could just be. Uh, the, the smaller numbers in second and uh, third trimester. And this definitely uh, needs to be uh, investigated more to, to see if there is actually something there or if it was just a statistical uh, power issue. Very good. 
Well, with that, I think we are winding up right on time. We did have a comment to say thank you for this work because there are many that still would like to know what the future holds for us. And thank I will agree with much. that. So thank you, Dr. Kimur Zogalu. And with that, I will pass it back to you, Maria. Great, thank you, Katie. We are approaching the end of today's webinar. A video recording will be available on the CHI website soon, and tomorrow you will receive an email containing a link to the recording. CHI's next partnership call from the CHI Alaska Partnership will take place next Wednesday, March 27th, and is titled Exploitation by Exposure, Human Rights and Toxic Exposures. To learn more and to RSVP, please visit our website at healthandenvironment.org. If you are new to CHE and would like to stay updated about upcoming events and more, please sign up to receive our newsletter by selecting the Join Us tab at the top of any page on our website. Additionally, if you appreciate these CHE partnership webinars, which bring you the latest environmental health research for free, we encourage you to support CHE's ongoing work by making a tax-deductible donation via our secure website. Again, our website is healthandenvironment.org. With that, I would like to thank our speaker for taking the time to talk with us today and Katie for her excellent moderation. Thank you so much for joining us and have a great day.